We are live on YouTube. Wait a few seconds for the attendees to climb. Okay, Tar, do you want to put up the uh, next slide? Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, for this panel discussion that we have on um, large surveys, catalogs, and classification. We have four speakers in this panel. Each speaker will be talking for 15 minutes. We're going to hold all the questions until the end of the session, uh, where we have allotted 30 minutes for discussion uh, with the panelists. If you have a question for the panelists or a specific panelist, be sure you may make mention that panelist when you ask that question. Questions will be uh, taken here on the Q&A and the Slack channel as well. Our moderator for this panel is Dr. Paul Green coming to us from the Chandra X-ray Center uh, via a security route. <laughs> Paul, take it away. Thanks, Rudy. Um, this should be a really interesting session um, and uh, all of the talks are intriguing. Let's start out with uh, Mara Salvato, who uh, works at MPE, and she'll be talking about identification of counterparts to x-ray sources using machine learning, but not only. Indeed. Uh, thank you, Paul, and thanks everybody for giving me uh, the chance to speak about the topic that is really important to me namely about identification and classification of counterparts of X-ray sources, in particular point-like X-ray sources. The work that I am going to show, or all the discussion, is based heavily on XMM and Sandra Cosmos, Rosa, XMM, Liu Tu, and Erosita. And the papers that are showing many of the results are listed here. There you find more literature, more comparison with literature, and a lot of discussion. And I would like to point out that despite me being present in the talk, I would like to highlight the fact that I have a lot of collaborators and they contributed a lot on the work that I'm showing. And I like to point out in particular the name here below. I will uh, uh, speak about the motivations. I will uh, try to list uh, all the possible uh, issues uh, that uh, we are uh, facing. Sorry, my cats uh, are not happy to close doors. Issues, I will present uh, some solution and uh, I will have a comparison between uh, uh, methods and then I will conclude with remarks. In order to not uh, confuse you uh, with the topic, uh, when I mention CTP in the talk, I'm speaking about counterparts. So let's uh, uh, remind ourselves about the goal that we have in mind is to find the right counterparts to X-ray sources. And here already the first issue uh, come up because uh, uh, X-ray emitters are not of only one type. You have uh, either the nuclear or uh, resolved sources within an extra galactic nearby uh, galaxy. You have uh, AGNs or quasars at different redshift, but you can also have uh, galactic sources or unresolved clusters, as I will show you later. And uh, so this implies that you cannot use a single feature to identify your uh, counterpart. The most complicated part then also comes from the fact that when for an X-ray source, you have one object in 30 or second, in optical, where normally you look for your counterpart, you have hundreds of sources. And the area search that you are investigating for finding the right counterparts depends on the positional um, accuracy of the survey or the instrument that you are using. And as a reference for those that are not familiar with the topic, 
I'm showing here the positional error for a Chandra cosmos, XMM cosmos, where you have only few are second area search needed, and then the extremely uh, large positional error for uh, uh, Rosat, almost one Arpinus, XMM SU2, and finally uh, Erosita. So you can imagine how easy it is to find uh, uh, multiple possible uh, counterparts. Uh, the other issue that we are facing is the fact that uh, depending on which uh, uh, catalog we are going to use for identifying our counterparts, we are going to get uh, different uh, answers. This is an actual case in XMM Cosmos, where depending on whether you use a zeta band catalog, K band catalog, or B band catalog, you are going to assign a different uh, counterpart. When normally at talks ask people to guess which is the best counterpart, everybody goes on the B band because there is one object right in the center where the center of the circle is. Instead, the right counterpart is the one detected in K band. And I'm using this example for making a point which I think for me is really relevant. When we are assigning a counterpart, what we are doing is considering the separation between the sources in the primary and secondary catalog. We consider the positional error for each source in each catalog. And we also consider the source number density in each catalog. It means that when we are using only one band, we are not taking into account the possibility that the actual counterpart is not detected in that specific band. And even if we decide to repeat the experiment XZ, XK, XB, and then a posteriori look at the higher probability for one of the counterparts to one of the sources to be the right counterpart is not uh, going to be always correct, and there is a, a, we compensate for the lack of information only partially. That's why what I think is the correct thing to do is to use all the catalogs, all the bands at the same time in a combinatorial way take into account also when an object is not present in the other catalog and then assign the probability. And here I'm making a sketch where uh, I try to explain what I mean. You have an X-ray source, catalog, source one in the catalog, and then you try every possible combination with the other three catalogs. And then for every combination, you assign a probability and you define your counterpart. This means that you have to go uh, by Asian. The other nice things of being a Bayesian is the fact that you can separate the probability of being the right counterpart from the spatial information, the part we just discussed, from the probability that is coming from the properties of the uh, objects of the right counterparts with respect of the uh, properties of the uh, field population. And I would like to use again this uh, uh, example before because uh, the nice part of being Bayesian is that you can use all three bands simultaneously and then simply multiply all the probabilities coming from each of the cases. But I would like to point out even another fact with this example, the fact that, that uh, when you look at these objects, there is a reason why an object is present in one band, barely visible in another, and strongly visible in the other. It is because of the SEDs of the objects. So if we learn to use all the information, not only magnitude, but the entire SED or other properties like morphology or variability, this is going to improve the probability that we are assigning the right counterpart. And we have now 20 years of XMM and Chandra data, uh, we know so much about the properties of X-ray emitters that we can actually go a step further and create a model or a prior that we can use for assigning the right counterpart. And this is what I would like to show uh, in the next uh, slide. Uh, here, uh, when you want to create a, a prior or a model, what you need is to have a training sample that is comparable to the catalog, to the properties of the catalog that you want to find the counterparts for. You need to have the control sample, and then you need the validation sample. Here, I, we have used for the definition of the counterparts to Rosat, we took the always counterparts of a sample of 3XMM DR5 sources at the depth of Rosat. And we have realized that when you compare W2 and W1 minus W2 for these X-ray emitters, the location in the parameter space is completely different than the bulk of the population of the control sample, where the control sample is 
formed by all the all wise sources within two arc minutes from every uh, rosat source. And the color of the pixels here is the in indicating the number density of object in each of the pixels. And I would like to stress even again more that we are not uh, making a selection on the type of uh, X-ray emitters. Here we have the stars, we have ellipticals, we have galaxies, and then we have uh, AGNs. So we use this model as prior, uh, ingested in, uh, in the code that is in particular uh, anyway, assign the counterparts, and uh, we then show, apply the same method on a sample of 1,500 sources with secure counterparts from uh, um, 3XMM, and shown uh, for those with a secure counterpart, we, we agreed with the selection of the counterpart to 97% of the time. Not only that, uh, despite the huge difference in uh, uh, positional accuracy between XMM, SLU2, and uh, ROSAT, the counterparts agrees for 98% of the time, 99% of the time. And while until now, for 20 years, we were using only the 2,000 bright, uh, brightest ROSAT sources for which we knew the counterparts, uh, we now can use under 15,000. We went wild for uh, erosita effects, and please, uh, in the questions, ask me uh, why we have uh, done that, because it is uh, very relevant. What we have done, we have used another training sample of uh, 23,000 XMM sources with depth comparable to uh, erosita with secure counterpart in the legacy survey. And we have compared these properties with the rest of the sources that are within 30 seconds from each X-ray position. Using random forest, we have identified which are the features that are uh, ideal for separating Control, control, uh, real source from uh, um, field population. And these are essentially the photometry expressed as flux uh, corrected for extinction in, this, in the optical and all-wise photometry, the Gaia photometry, but also the detection uh, level of the source, the proper motion, the parallax, and these colors. And when we apply the, these uh, features, uh, on the validation sample formed by 3,500 Chandra sources with comparable depth to Erosita again, you can see how pure and highly pure and complete our sample uh, became. We managed to get the right counterpart for more than 95% of the sources. The important things to say here is that not only this validation sample has the same comparable depth to Erosita, but we also modified the positional error and we made it Erosita-like uh, so that we were not uh, um, cheating um, searching for a counterpart very close uh, to the uh, X-ray position. We also uh, compared the uh, method with the more uh, traditional method, which is the maximum uh, likelihood uh, method, using the same uh, training control sample and validation samples. Um, Antonis has used uh, the um, astromatch. Uh, the maximum likelihood in astromatch and try to identify the counterpart using a 3D distribution in W2, W1, minus W2, and morphology information, an optical and uh, wise color, and again, magnet, uh, morphology, and then uh, G band, and then run the maximum likelihood on the three method independently and select for each X ray source the one that. Uh, was having the higher likelihood the, in, uh, independent on the, on the method. And you can see that also uh, uh, they were able to, uh, to find uh, high purity and high completeness. The huge difference is that uh, with Enway, only 2% of the sources have uh, more than one possible counterpart, while in the other method, more than 10% of the sources have uh, more than one possible counterpart. And the reason is simply because uh, you are uh, limited by the number of parameters that you can use for uh, selecting the right counterpart with respect to the uh, field population. While when you are using all this uh, uh, amount of data, it's really easy to uh, identify uh, 
um, to, to disentangle the counterparts from the field population. Oh, the two methods, pro yes, I'm perfectly fine. Uh, the two methods agree uh, on 88% of the sources. And what is interesting is that the fraction of disagreement is increasing when, uh, the, with the large, uh, when the positional uh, error become large. This is because you are increasing uh, the area search and the probability of finding another two similar objects, uh, two objects with similar properties in a so small limited parameter space uh, increase. While uh, even if you lo look in two arc minutes, uh, the probability of finding two objects that are similar in a, a combination of all these parameters is uh, very uh, limited. So I am already uh, giving my final remarks um, using a single magnitude band. Uh, when we do that, we do not account for the possibility that the counterpart is absent in that specific band. This means that when we are giving a probability of chance association, we are uh, um, underestimating uh, the correct probability. Uh, we are now in the position of using priors for assigning the correct counterparts, but we have to be extremely careful in the way in which to define uh, this prior, and I'm happy to um, discuss more at this point uh, later in the uh, QA. I also would like to be keep in mind that because X-ray emitters are a galactic, uh, can be galactic sources, resolved sources nearby galaxies, AGN quasars, or a resolved cluster, can be tricky uh, to focus the specific search of any specific object, type of objects uh, without taking into account all the possible other uh, X-ray emitters. And finally, uh, what I would like to make the point of is that when you do first the identification of the counterparts, take into account all the properties regardless of the nature of the emitter, you can find out something that is extremely interesting. And this is shown in, in this figure. In the point source catalog of uh, um, IFEDS, we have found about 155 uh, sources that are consistent with uh, BCGs. You can see uh, them in yellow and you see in uh, green and red the evolutionary track of S0 and elliptical galaxies. And when we went to compare uh, search for clusters pretending at this point like sources were actually clustered, indeed we have found uh, the clusters. In squares you have uh, the uh, counterpart that we have assigned with N way, but actually this is the BCGs of the two optical clusters. So I think that first come identification regardless of uh, type of objects and then come the classification. And with this, uh, uh, I am finishing my talk. I'm looking forward to the questions later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mara. Really interesting. Amazing. Um, uh, amazing science coming, coming out of Irozita and will continue for a long time. So um, our next talk uh, is about cross-matching with the Chandra source catalog, um, and it's by Arnold Rotz. Thank you. Oh, um, yes, cross-matching with Chandra source catalog, uh, there are some uh, special problems. Uh, that one needs to uh, take care of. Uh, most uh, recently, Dong Wu and I have been uh, trying to get this right. Um, we've had uh, help in the past uh, from Tamas de Budavari, of course. Um, and this is uh, purely uh, based on uh, spatial matching. Um, and why? Doesn't my ah no okay uh, cross used to be simple in the past uh, when we were all very young at least when I was uh, if you had a blue and a red plate it wasn't too hard to figure out which star was which and that was it uh, now uh, what do we have uh, uh, for for problems when we get to the gender source catalog uh, cross matching. Uh, of course, it started out as a visual exercise, and subsequently, uh, people started to uh, look uh, within a generally fixed radial proximity, um, something of the order of a few arc seconds. But 
uh, that becomes problematic. Um, it particularly does not work well, work well, well for uh, catalogs uh, that are taken from very different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, because the detected sources in these separate catalogs may represent physically very different objects, which may or may not be visible uh, at uh, other uh, frequencies or, or energies. Um, also, uh, when we have catalogs where that are derived from observations with very significantly different uh, PSFs, um, a source in a lower resolution catalog may represent a blend from multiple sources from a higher resolution one, and conversely, uh, a single source in a higher resolution catalog may be covered by the PSFs of multiple sources of uh, a lower resolution one, and that uh, can get us into trouble. Uh, so what is required to solve all of this? Uh, a rigorous calculation of the match probabilities uh, based on detected uh, positions and their error ellipses, and a robust method to set the uh, threshold at which uh, probabilities are accepted. Uh, this is particularly to uh, provide some consistency across fields with uh, varying, uh, varying source densities, because the source densities also play into these probabilities. Uh, and secondly, uh, reliable PSF information uh, and a way to apply that. And actually, uh, we've extended that to using uh, what we call raw size, uh, because uh, what may be a point source in a low resolution catalog and may be a slightly extended source uh, in another. Um, so um, we use the uh, uh, Bayesian algorithms that were developed in Buddha Fadi and Saleh, uh, adapted for elliptical errors, uh, the self consistency argument uh, that they uh, suggested. Uh, to set the acceptance threshold. Um, then uh, raw size information is folded into the probability calculation and ambiguous matches are very explicitly identified on the basis of the accepted pairwise matches. For direct use the math, I won't spend any time on that. Uh, you calculate uh, base factors for the pairs or for the, the tuples rather if you have more than two catalogs, and then you calculate the probabilities uh, uh, using uh, uh, these formulae. Um, then the question is, after you have calculated probabilities, uh, how do we set the probability threshold above uh, which we do trust uh, a match? Uh, and that's what I refer to the self-consistency threshold. Uh, what it what you do is you order the tuples under that are under consideration um, in decreasing probability and you accept the first k matches where k is the sum of the probabilities all the tuples in the set and that sort of provides a, a, a self consistent uh, um, uh, uh, criterion for uh, where the uh, cutoff probability lies. Um, the other issue is uh, PSF and the raw size. Um, uh, what to do if PSFs are vastly different um, and or uh, slightly extended sources are involved. Uh, and this is uh, a an, an, uh, somewhat new uh, territory. Um, you, in the uh, figure here, uh, you, you see the problem. Uh, the dashed uh, ellipses are the uh, PSFs, uh, the uh, uh, solid ellipses, the uh, errors. Uh, and this may or may not be uh, uh, judged a match on the basis of the error ellipses, uh, but uh, uh, clearly uh, there is a good chance that it is actually a match. And so what we've been doing is calculating base factors 
on the basis of the error ellipses as well as the uh, raw size ellipses use the greater of the two. Uh, this is a somewhat uh, intuitive argument, but actually it works and it works well. Um, now, uh, raw size obviously also plays a role in identifying ambiguous batches, uh, as I argued uh, before. Um, so in those cases, uh, we do not just select the match with the highest probability, uh, that would be uh, uh, dangerous. Um, the figure shows uh, an example of uh, two extended source, two, two uh, high resolution sources in, in, in one uh, catalog, uh, a single uh, source, but with a much, very much larger PSF in uh, the, the lower resolution catalog. Uh, and clearly you get ambiguity here. Um, and we call those out uh, explicitly. So here is the procedural outline of uh, what, how, how we uh, uh, do our matching. Uh, we run uh, X match uh, using both the error and raw size ellipses. That's the first run. Identify all the sources with ambiguous, that is to say with uh, uh, multiple matches. Uh, from that set, we remove ambiguous matches where one pair's match is clearly superior. So that gets tossed out of the ambiguous uh, collection. Then we run X match again, the second run uh, with using error ellipses only. Um, from those results, uh, we exclude uh, unique match matches from run two that were deemed ambiguous in run one. Um, just to be uh, uh, conservative about uh, uh, accepting uh, unique matches. Uh, but the remaining unique matches uh, then are labeled as definite, um, whereas uh, remaining valid unique matches from run one uh, are uh, uh, labeled as likely, uh, or one might say uh, uh, possible uh, uh, unique matches. Uh, here are a couple of uh, examples, um, a possible uh, match example. Uh, this is between uh, CSC2 uh, and uh, SDSS. Um, uh, in uh, the, 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 the larger uh, ellipses uh, are uh, the uh, PSS or the raw sizes. Uh, the smaller ellipses, uh, it's actually uh, cyan in the, uh, for, for the green one. Uh, are the error ellipses, it's not distinguishable for, for SDSS. Uh, now note, uh, these are still uh, not very close obviously, but uh, it depends on the, the, the source density uh, of the field. And this match, I'm sure, would not stand a chance in a crowded field. Uh, there one has to be uh, much more uh, careful uh, and, and uh, selective in uh, allowing uh, matches, accepting matches. Uh, another example. Um, and the same thing uh, holds through uh, there. Um, now, an ambiguous ma uh, match sample. Uh, um, clearly, uh, the uh, two closest uh, SDSS sources uh, make a decent match uh, with the uh, uh, Chanda source. Uh, however, uh, if one of them had been uh, absent, uh, then uh, there would have been a unique match uh, because the uh, probability of the matches uh, with the uh, two uh, SDS sources uh, to the east, uh, to the to the west, sorry, uh, uh, would have a much uh, lower, uh, do actually have much lower uh, probabilities. And a similar situation here, uh, this is a set of, uh, uh, or this is an ambiguous match 
uh, between uh, Chandra and uh, Pan stars. Uh, and the same thing is, is true here. Uh, the uh, uh, two closest uh, uh, matches with Pan stars uh, have quite a decent uh, probability uh, had one of them not been uh, present. Uh, then probably the other one uh, would have uh, resulted in a unique match, um, as the uh, other three uh, sources further away have considerably lower probabilities. Um, to finish this up, uh, we currently have uh, cross mass uh, lists between uh, the different. Uh, Chandra catalog uh, and SDSS uh, release 17, data release 17, uh, Pan stars, Gaia, Gaia data release 2, all wise and 2 mass, and will we hope to uh, uh, continue uh, this list. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks very much, Arnold. Excellent. And uh, and also you you recouped the little bit of time we lost uh, in the intro, so that's appreciated. So pop any questions into the Q&A or the chat or, or the Slack in approximately that order of priority. Um, next, we get to hear from uh, Iris Trollson at uh, the Leibniz Institute for Astrophysics in Potsdam, the AIP, about the XMM Newton serendipitous source catalogs and source variability. So, Iris, uh, can you start your presentation? You're muted, I think. Maybe you could try to reselect your microphone again. Good, now we can see it. But can we hear you? I don't hear anything yet. No sound. Still no sound. Still no sound. So you might need to rejoin if you're not finding a, a way to wake up your microphone. Here is, yeah, can you try to do the microphone again and then see if it will reselect your audio input? No, uh, can you speak? Oh, yep, there you are. There you are. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. So, I Good. with a browser plug in, one has to give the permissions repeatedly. Okay, thanks a lot for the introduction. I will, I will go into full screen mode now and hope you can see my slides. Okay, now after learning a lot about matching, I will inform you about. Another series of catalogs with which you can match the source catalogs provided by the XMM Newton Service Science Center Consortium. I assume that most of you are more or less familiar with Jandra's European sibling, XMM Newton, also launched in 99, also performing pointed observations, meanwhile, more than 14,000. A satellite carries three X-ray telescopes and one optical telescope, six instruments in total, where we here concentrate on the three CCD cameras from which we derive the catalogs presented today. 
it has a re relatively large field of view uh, with half a degree in diameter, which we can use for source detection, finding between a dozen and a few hundred of additional X-ray emitters besides the main target of an observation. From all the data collected over meanwhile 20 years, a series of catalogs is, is published, the mentioned catalogs from the CCD instruments. In addition, there's a catalog of sources found during slews while the telescope is slewing from one target to the next, data is taken. And there's a huge catalog of sources observed with the optical monitor on board XMM Newton. We, we publish the catalogs from pointed observations with the most recent additions just became public one week ago. They are produced, as I said, by the XMM Newton Survey Science Center Consortium, which spreads about several European countries here indicated with their respective responsibilities. And we closely collaborate with ESA's Science Operations Center near Madrid. Together, we we provide the science analysis software to work with XM Newton data. The SOC provides the pipeline processing and as I see the catalogs. Here in Potsdam, we are responsible of the source detection tasks that come together with the science analysis software, the, which is public and which are used in the catalog creation. And we develop and produce the catalogs from overlapping observations. Source detection on XMM Newton data is done via maximum likelihood PSF fitting. And since the PSF strongly depends on the instrument, on the position of the, of the source on the CCD and other factors, we choose a PSF model for each source in each individual image that is taken. So we cannot merge any data, but we process all images individually and fit the, the images of a source simultaneously. To test for source extent, we follow the PSF with the beta model. So in total, our three parameters in the source detection are the count rate in each individual input image, the source position, which is assumed to be the same in all images, and the extent radius. From that information, we create source lists, and from the source lists, our catalog, and this plot should give you an impression of what has been done over the last about 20 years from the first catalog published in 2003 to those published last weeks, where the dark blue bars inform you about all detections, the green bars about the increasing number of observations. And we have now reached in, in the catalog from pointed observations about 900,000 detections of 600,000 unique sources seen by XMM. The catalogs include, of course, all the outcome of the source detection process, so the aforementioned three parameters, all parameters that can be derived from them, like fluxes and hardness ratios, and information about the conditions under which a source was observed, so the exposure time, the background level, the date of the observation, instrument configuration, and so on. You can assess the catalogs in FITS format directly from our SSC websites, and you can browse them at different places, including ESA's XSA interface, where you can also find additional products like, like images and finding charts. You may have seen that over the last years, a new flavor of this catalog pops up in this, in this plot here. Those having an S in their name, their S stands for stacked source detections. And these are the catalogs that we produce here in Potsdam, the catalogs from overlapping observations. By going for a new kind of catalog over the two decades, many of the fields indicated here in the sky map by exposure time have been visited repeatedly because uh, objects are used as calibration objects or deep or these are deep fields of, of interest, or just arbitrarily because PIs have applied for closely neighbored targets. And if we combine these overlapping observations, we can make use of the long total effective exposure time, which allows us to become more sensitive to faint sources 
to constrain the source parameters better than in a source detection run in the individual observation. And we can assess long-term variability of the sources by deriving fluxes directly from the source detection process. To give you an impression what that means, here's here are snapshots brought to the same brightness scales from repeated observations of a target to the upper left. We start with one observation of 10 kiloseconds and to the lower right, we end up with 36 observations and 400 kiloseconds in total. And I hope this is convincing uh, to show you that the longer we observe, the more objects we can see, of course. The catalogs from overlapping observations essentially include all source parameters that you know from the catalogs from individual observations, and they list them from the combined source detection run for the whole stack of observations, and they are listed for each contributed, contributing observation. This means we have fluxes of a source for each observation that covers a source, completely independent of whether the source could be detected in this individual observation separately. It can be detected in the stack, so we have the fluxes of all observations, and we can investigate long-term flux variability, and therefore we provide several measures of variability in the catalog, including, for example, uh, the ratio of maximum to minimum flux, and also flux ratio variability. The latest release one week ago now includes 275,000 repeatedly observed sources, Repeatedly, very often means twice, um, but there are also sources that were observed up to 65 times and covered by almost three megaseconds in total. An order of 8,000 of these sources are candidates for inter-observation variability. Why do we do all this? Uh, what could you do with these catalogs? Of course, there's there broad range of possible applications of the catalog, search for new sources or for counterparts. So for example, the ForexMM catalogs are used by the Irisita consortium to compare new Irisita discoveries with previous XMM observations. And you can find, may find a few examples in the two special issues published in Astronomy and Astrophysics this year can be used in classification programs, like in a catalog of ultraluminous X-ray sources that our former master student Michael Colomb published. You can investigate, of course, all parameters of known sources of your interest, which you may have found in other wavelengths. And particularly, you can look for new or for known variability of sources. I'm giving a few examples here. This is a source that was discovered by stacked observation. To the left, you see the, the individual snapshots of this source. And in two of these circles, something becomes visible, while during other individual observations, this source could not be detected. To the right, there's the flux light curve of the source, where the red dot gives the mean flux from the stacked source detection. The blue Symbols are the individual observations, and wherever you see a, cr a cross, this means that the source could not be detected in the individual observation, but we get a we get a flux value from the stacked source detection. Of course, since it was faint during that observation, or the observation was too short, these fluxes are affected by relatively large error bars. More examples given here, long-term light curve of a quasar, a gamma ray burst afterglow, and again, there, there are points included where the source could not be detected in the individual observation. Something I came across during quality screening of the catalog popping up in one catalog, the source was not included previously because it was too fine, and then that happened, high mass X-ray binary in outburst. And to give you a rough idea of what we are seeing in the catalog, stars, interacting binaries, galaxies. Here are the results from a positional cross-match with SDSS and SIMBAT. So not what Maha has shown, but just pure positional cross-match with about 5% false associations in it. Total number of matches we found with our catalog. 
and the percentage of variability among all matches, variable or not. What will be the next steps? Of course, we will continue catalog development, also more, even more concentrating on source variability. We will exploit the synergies with the Irasita consortium. And we, this year, we have kicked off a EU project called XMM to Athena, where Potsdam and Saclet together host the work package Enhanced Stack Catalog. Adriana Pires, who is also attending this meeting, is, is working in that project. And we aim at improvements to the source detection on overlapping observations, increasing the detection sensitivity even further, and hopefully also overcoming some technical issues. So to summarize, I've shown you two flavors of the XMM new serendipitous source catalogs, those from individual pointings and those from overlapping observations, which are published together with auxiliary products like images and for brighter, light, uh, for brighter objects, spectra and light curves, with the stacked source detection on overlapping observations, we gain that we can constrain source parameters better, we have higher sensitivity, and we can also reduce the spurious content of the catalog a bit because each source detection will deliver false positives. The main application or a main application of, the, of those catalogs is search for inter-observation variability. And since we publish yearly increments, Please stay tuned for the next updates and thank you for your attention. And thank you, Iris, for a really interesting talk. Um, that's fantastic to, uh, to begin including long-term variability. And of course, it'll overlap so much with, uh, with E. Rosita, which by its very nature is mapping the sky uh, Eight times, right? Eight, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah. Please pop any questions <clears throat> into the uh, into the Slack, ideally, and uh, we'll move on to our final talk by Pauline Barmby at Western University, and it's about classifying Chandra sources in the Andromeda Galaxy. Okay, do we have uh, slides visible for folks? Yes, awesome. you're audible and visible. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, good evening or good morning or good afternoon to all of you wherever in the world you might be. Um, I'm at Western University in Canada, which is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lunawapak, and the Attawandaran peoples. And I'm really excited to be telling you about uh, this project that was done mostly by my former PhD student, Robin Arson, but uh, also in collaboration with another former PhD student, Evan Vulich. So I wanna thank the organizers for inviting me to play an X-ray astronomer on YouTube because I'm only sort of one. Um, and what I wanna tell you about it in particular is uh, a, a different kind of machine learning x-ray data analysis project than the ones we've heard of so far. So I'm going to be talking in particular about nearby galaxies, about at the x-ray sources within nearby galaxies. Why do we care about nearby galaxies in general? Well, because they're awesome, of course. But um, if we want to understand the history of galaxies, the stellar populations of galaxies, we can't just assume that the Milky Way is, is the only one that's interesting or that's the only one that has a, something to tell us. And particularly when we're interested in stars and stellar populations and things that might be X-ray sources, the Milky Way can be, um, can be kind of a pain because you have to worry about how far away everything is. And uh, as anybody who has tried to figure out the distance to a, a galactic X-ray binary knows, that's not always so fun. So looking at other galaxies gives us a broader picture, and it also gives us a set of sources that we hope are all at the same distance that someone else has figured out for us. 
the other reasons we might care about X-ray binaries in nearby galaxies are that they seem to trace the properties of the galaxy overall quite well. So the HMXB population traces something about the star formation rate. The LMXB population traces something about the stellar mass. And there's the important question of whether or not X-ray binaries were sufficient to reionize the universe or to play an important role in the universe in, in the early days. Uh, and the answer to that is something that we haven't quite figured out yet. So I'm going to talk about uh, Andromeda in particular, and I'm just highlighting here the, uh, the other galaxies that have been looked at by the new star, um, Starburst and local group sample, which is a fantastic data set for looking at X-ray sources in nearby galaxies. So our goal here was to look at Andromeda's X-ray population. And, and M31 has been uh, observed a lot of times with every telescope you can think of, including Chandra and XMM and New Star and ROSAT and every other telescope. In particular, I'm gonna be focusing on the data set that's outlined um, by the red and yellow squares here in this somewhat messy diagram. So in this paper that Nevin Woolich uh, wrote a couple of years back, he took all of the existing Chandra data up to about 2015, added it all together, um, ran ACES extract on it, and um, generated a source list of about 950 sources. This work does not include the uh, Chandra fat data set, which covers mostly this blue region here. These are the regions that um, were observed in M31 with Hubble as part of the fat project. So of these 950 sources, um, there's a relatively low luminosity limit, so 10 to the 34 ergs per second. And about 110 of them already had identifications as X-ray binaries, AGN, foreground stars, and supernova remnants. And these are the, the, the categories of classification we're going to use um, from here going forward. One bad thing about nearby galaxies is that you do have to worry about foreground stars because your nearby galaxy covers enough sky that there's going to be some foreground. So this is the data set we're working on. And the idea with this project was to see whether we could use the X-ray data alone to try to categorize the sources. Um, this overlay here shows you where the um, Chandra observations of M31 were. That's the black squares here. Uh, and then the red dots are the sources that we're dealing with in our particular, uh, in our particular project. What we learned from the original, um, just extract all the data and don't worry about uh, exactly what they are, is that we do find some differences between the bulge and disk X-ray luminosity functions, which suggests that M31 has very few bright disk high mass X-ray binaries. And that was part of the motivation for this project was to see if we could find some more X-ray binaries. If we take just those 950 sources and look at their um, cumulative luminosity function or the cumulative flux distribution, what we see is that the difference between what you'd expect from known AGN, that's the purple at the bottom, and known LMXBs, there's a lot of space in between here. There's a lot of objects where we don't know what they are. And uh, that's particularly bad at the faint end of the hard luminosity function. So how do people try to figure out what these objects are? Uh, you've already heard a couple of examples of how do people do this um, by trying to match to optical surveys and find counterparts. And that's kind of the gold standard for this work. But that's, of course, can be quite difficult in that you have all these technical problems we've already heard about, including PSFs that don't match or what if there just is no optical counterpart. One approach that people have taken uh, has been to use two or three dimensions of X-ray data. For example, you compute a hardness ratio, hard to soft and medium to soft bands. And maybe you use that in conjunction with uh, some measure of brightness. So that's what I'm showing in this 3D diagram here, hard to soft on this axis, medium to soft on this one, and then brightness on the vertical axis. And you could kind of see that in this three-dimensional space, our different types of sources do separate out a little bit. 
certainly the supernova remnants all want to be down here in the corner. Um, the AGN are kind of all over the place, as are the X-ray binaries. And the foreground stars, most of them are down here, in, again, in the corner with the, with the supernova remnants, but they do spread out a bit as well. So, you know, this is a good first step, but we wanted to see if we could do a little bit more than that. And so what we were trying to do here was use supervised machine learning methods, things like random forest or logistic regression, um, use not just count rates in the standard Chandra bands, hard, medium, soft, or however you want to cut them up, but in a number of smaller bands that cover maybe a few KEB instead of uh, five or six that we already had from ACES Extract. And then take our training set, which is not that big, about 100 objects, apply it to our test set, uh, which again is not that big, um, and see what we can do. And the nice thing about this is that we do have the fat HST data, which we can then use as something of a gold standard to see how well did this X-ray only classification scheme work. So we used many of the um, tried and true favorite machine learning techniques that you can find in scikit-learn. And so we threw logistic regression and naive, ba naive Bayes classification, support vector machines, all your favorite things at, uh, at this classification pro problem. And we found that the random forest method, that's the pink line here, works the best. So this is a receiver operator characteristic curve that you've probably you've seen before in some of these talks. And an ideal uh, classifier would, would have kind of a straight line going all the way up here and then making a right turn. So we at least do better than random, which is the dashed line across the center here. What we find is that the accuracy is not fantastic, um, even for the best one. So if you restrict yourself to just a binary classification, is an object an X-ray binary or is it not? So we don't care whether it's a supernova running or a star, um, your accuracy is about 85%. If you are using a multi-class, so those same four categories that I mentioned earlier, it's about 60%. So, you know, that's not great, but it's also better than just guessing randomly, which if your goal is to find um, sources for follow-up is, is pretty reasonable. We looked a little bit in detail about what was driving the classification. And so we looked at the mean Gini decrease. That's a pretty standard thing that people do. And we found actually that the standard Chandra bands are not quite the most informative thing here. Instead, the two to four KEV photometry, the 1.5 to 2.5 KEV photometry, and also two to seven KEV, that's what's driving the classification here. And what I'm plotting on the two axes is the same measurement, but with the Python and R implementations of random forests, where you see that the agreement between these quantities is pretty good, but it's actually not perfect. And whether that's just because of the randomness involved or because the implementations have hyperparameters that are not easily accessible between them, um, we never did manage to figure that out. A plus of the random forest scheme is that you can use it to give a probabilistic classification. So you can see in how many decision trees decided that this object was an AGN or a supernova remnant or an X-ray binary or whatnot. And an interesting thing about comparing the distributions here for the multi-class situation is that only the X-ray binary um, category had very high confidence membership uh, basically. So there's, there's a few objects for which this random forest scheme is pretty sure that they're X-ray binaries. There's actually not very many for which it's pretty sure that they're supernova remnants or foreground stars. And this is just showing the same thing, but for the binary case, where the probability here is backwards. So probability one means it's a non-X-ray binary. Probability zero would mean it's an X-ray binary. And again, there are some high confidence classes. So if we then say, okay, how did we do? Uh, how, how well, what does this classification have to do with, with, uh, with the real universe? We found that nine of our objects match to objects that were found in the HST FAT observations. So what I'm showing here are the X-ray class in the colored 
boxes at the bottom here. This is the HST picture here. And what you can see in the top row is that five of our new X-ray binary candidates match to things that look like star clusters in the Hubble imaging. Um, sorry, four of our X-ray binary uh, things match to things that look like star clusters. One of our AGN candidates match to something that looks like a star cluster. Three so minutes. that's pretty good because we expect that X-ray binary should live in star clusters. We don't really expect AGN to live in star clusters, but you know you can't win them all. Um, if we look at um, our um, X-ray classified objects that match with things that were listed by the FAT catalog as unknown, we have three things that are AGN. Uh, maybe there's a faint galaxy in the middle here, maybe not. Um, this one definitely looks like a faint galaxy. And then one where the X-ray classification is foreground star and the HST image also looks like a foreground star. So again, the sample size is small, but, uh, but the results are reasonably promising. And so the conclusions here are that, uh, max, that uh, machine learning algorithms can be used to classify unknown X-ray sources, even with a relatively small uh, training set. The accuracy is not the 99% that you might hope for in more mission critical obser observations, but it's also not terrible. And um, an interesting thing to point out is that the less commonly used narrower X-ray bands seem to give better discrimination between different categories of objects. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, Pauline, great talk. Um, so we can, um, we can start to look at the questions now. We have half an hour. Um, and as we go, I imagine that some more questions will occur to people. Um, so you can pop those into the Slack. Um, and uh, that might include questions for particular people, which you should make clear at the beginning of your question um, or uh, sort of general questions for discussion. So let me get the view so I see everybody. Because right now I think I'm just seeing panelists. That's all you'll see, Paul. <laughs> Oh, okay. I thought I could see everybody. Okay. Um, so I guess I guess we'll start with uh, some questions for Mara from the first talk. And um, Rafael Martinez Galarza is asking, um, can you elaborate on, on what exactly is the input of your random forest method? And what are the classes into which you are trying to classify? Yes. So that is going to be very uh, fast answer. So essentially we took uh, 23,000 XMM sources with secure counterpart distributed all over the sky because we wanted to have very representative of X-ray sources. We looked at the properties uh, of these uh, source counterparts in the legacy survey D rate. And uh, we also collected the same information for all the sources within 30 or second from every X-ray position of this training sample. And then with Random Forest, we have identified which are the features uh, that are able to uh, better distinguish between uh, the actual counterpart uh, and the field population. We then have selected these features and submitted to the validation sample. So apply the selection to the validation sample. The classes are two. Either you are an X-ray emitter or you are not. So we are not interested in classifying the source. We just want to know whether you are X-ray emitting or not, regardless whether you are a star, binary compact object, elliptical, BCG, quasar, AGN. Once we have done, we have selected our feature, we are happy with our uh, probability. What we have done is uh, taking the entire legacy survey, the array catalog, and for each source there, we have assigned the probability of being an X-ray emitter. And then we have used uh, this probability combined with the probability coming from the spatial information 
put in, ingested in the end way in a Bayesian way. And that gave us finally the probability for a given source to be the right counterpart. Aha, thank you. Um, Rafael was also wondering if you correct for uh, proper motions against yeah. the, the actual uh, observation, X-ray observation epochs when you do the matching. Kind of, in the sense that uh, we don't correct for the uh, time between uh, um, the Rosita observation and the optical observation, because they are actually very uh, kind of close in time. The work of correcting for a proper motion is uh, done by the legacy survey, uh, the R8 team already, because what they do, they uh, take the, the uh, frame and uh, uh, register them to Gaia sources. And for that, then take into account the epoch, they correct for it, don't ask me how, but the proper motion of the sources is taken into account from the people that are essentially uh, made the legacy survey the rate, which is then used, uh, just to remind you, for the selection of the sources in the DAISY uh, survey. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Um, still for you, Mara. Uh, this is from Jeremy hair and uh, he's got two questions. Uh, I'm curious how you corrected the counterpart fluxes for absorption. This is very difficult in the galactic plane and many 3D extinction maps under predict the amount of absorption in certain directions or at certain distances. Um, they're also incomplete past a few kiloparsecs in many directions. So how do you so we were, correct the again, again, we were using the uh, sport, the extinction correction that is suggested by the legacy survey. We didn't do anything uh, extra. It was important to include uh, this correction because uh, since you are uh, looking for colors of sources that are affected by the redshift itself uh, uh, of the counterpart, you needed to take the extinction correction into account. Because we are using not only uh, the photometry from legacy, but also the original photometry from Gaia, which is not correct for extinction, we are also having uh, this information of uh, non-extinction for stars uh, and uh, extinction for the extragalactic sources. I agree that uh, uh, the results may change a little bit depending on the uh, 3D map of the extinction that we are using, but it is uh, definitely important to use uh, what we have because since our sources are located everywhere in the sky and everywhere you have a different extinction, if you do not make the correction for extinction, you are not able to find the right feature identifying the counterpart. Right. So I guess the implication is that, that making, um, you know, knowing what the true X-ray flux is involves correcting for the extinction. And in order to do that in a three-dimensional mm -hmm. sense, uh, you need to know what the distance is. No, no, wait a moment. I think we are I'm speaking of two things different. I'm speaking about uh, correcting for galactic extinction, the multi wavelength properties, the catalogs, not the X-ray. I'm not, because in my analysis, I'm not using the X-ray information. I'm using only the multi wavelength properties of the sources, and I'm looking at the properties that identify them as X ray emitter. I'm not looking at the X ray flux. I'm not making any correction there. I'm using purely extinction from optical uh, information. Thank you for asking because that is an extremely important point. Is we are not using X over O or any other kind of uh, information that imply the use of X ray fluxes. I see. Okay. Um, his second question from Jeremy, we found Gaia parallaxes can be incorrect for many sources, especially when the uncertainties are very large. Have you tried also feeding the random forest algorithm the parallax uncertainties? Uh, I should ask uh, uh, Julian Wolf, who did the work. Uh, it can be that the features was uh, used and then rejected because not informative enough. 
Uh, after all, in the 27,000, given the area where we are looking, the stellar component is uh, very limited. We are more uh, uh, interested in the extragalactic part. So even if there is uh, an error for some of the sources, uh, uh, I think we can survive uh, with. There is uh, the parallel work done by uh, exactly, Julian just wrote to me that uh, exactly we tested, but uh, it was not given enough information. If you look at the work of uh, Christian uh, Schneider, he was given invited talk on Monday uh, last week. Uh, he actually uh, used, uh, um, said, was searching for the stars uh, in the IFETS area to take into account proper motion and correcting, uh, take into account also the uncertainties. And at the end, we agreed for 90% of the stellar component. I see. Thank you. Still uh, for Mara, this one from me. Uh, so what happens, uh, it's not clear to me, what happens for the many counterparts that may not have certain key data like they don't have a Gaia parallax or proper motion. Maybe they don't have a wise counterpart. Um, and, and how does this affect the estimated match confidence? Yes, that is a very nice question. Actually, it's an interesting result. So essentially, they uh, splitting the probability coming from the spatial uh, distribution and from the properties allows you to tell whether the object is behaving like a typical X-ray emitter or not. And this is telling you there is something wrong uh, with the counterpart, or we are looking for, a, we are finding a weird object. There are objects where uh, the uh, probability of being the right counterpart was extremely low. And indeed, uh, looking at near infrared photometry, we have found uh, that uh, a possible better counterpart uh, will be uh, will be available, will be um, identified if uh, it was uh, considered. So there are a few cases where uh, the information is not uh, is not sufficient, but they are like a handful of uh, of sources. But again, the probability, the value of the probability, tells you uh, whether it is. Uh, uh, an object that is behaving like a typical X-ray emitter or not. And if it is not, then this becomes an interesting object to look further. Great. So I will not, so I will not uh, uh, reject uh, objects uh, with a low probability of being the X-ray emitter. I will actually go to look at them. Why did you behave like that is something uh, interesting, like the catalog was not uh, decomposing properly, or you need another catalog, or it was a variable object, or whatever. So this is actually an information that allows you to make uh, new science. Great. I think I think we'll probably get back to related topics in a, in the more general part of the discussion. Thank you. Um, I had a question for you, Arnold. So. It's, it's really good and important to keep track of ambiguous matches when the probabilities are similar. Um, tiny plug, um, we're, we're doing, the Chandra X-ray Center is doing a spectroscopic follow-up of Chandra source catalog sources as matched um, by Arnold and Dongwu um, for Sloan 5 spectroscopy. And um, that has already begun. It's going to be a uh, it's going to be a public product. Uh, we're hoping for maybe fifty thousand Sloan spectra of Chandra source catalog counterparts. Um, but there are these cases where um, where there are ambiguous matches, and in some cases, you really actually want to get spectra for both sources if you can, and that will be possible um, in Sloan 5 in some cases, if the sources are bright enough. So there is already a, a public version of the uh, uh, Chandra source catalog matched to Sloan, is that correct? Yes, and does that, yeah. does that include the ambiguous matches as well? Uh, yes, that includes the ambiguous matches. Great. At least, let me double check that. Uh, 
Yep, it does. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, so the next question is for Iris and it's from uh, Raphael. Do you provide short-term light curves as part of the catalog release? That's question one. So Iris, do you, is there, yes. are there short-term light the, curves? The usual question, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks, because, because I couldn't hear you for, for a while, but I got the question. So yes, yes, we provide uh, short-term light curves for brighter objects. So just for simplicity, let me let me call the catalog from individual observations the large catalog, and the one from overlapping observations the stack catalog. So each source that reaches a certain count number in the large catalog comes with a light curve for that observation and with a variability measure of this intra-observation variability. Fainter sources uh, are not, well, come, come without that just up for obvious reasons. If there are not enough counts, we cannot estimate variability. Um, yeah, and, and so there are associations between the large and the stacked catalog sources as well? Yes, and they are part of the stacked catalog. So, which is by number the the smaller catalog. Sorry, I cannot hear you at the moment. I'm not speaking. Oh, okay, that's good. Okay, uh, the, yes, the associations are part of the stacked catalog. So each source in the stacked catalog is matched with the large catalog, again with a purely positional match and the closest association is chosen and propagated into the stacked catalog. There's one warning. Um, I only use high quality sources from the large catalog. So if you are interested in counterparts of your pet object in both catalogs, but all high quality sources in the large catalog are in, included in the stack catalog together with their short-term variability measure. Excellent, thank you. Um, I had a question for you also. Um, are the, you mentioned the various um, variability estimators that you list in the stacked catalog and are they similar to or analogous to the variability estimators that are published in the large catalog? No, since the, the methods used for an, a uninterrupted observations are not necessarily the best to assess ver variability between observations where we go to the mean fluxes per observation. So, both of us are doing chi-square tests, but we are doing it differently. I see. Thank you. Um, and we have some questions for Pauline as well. So um, from Raphael, who's obviously a very curious character. Uh, he says, that was a nice talk. I think they were all nice talks, by the way. Um, and. Uh, he wants to know, how did you construct your training set? How many classes were included? And uh, were they equally represented in the training set? Right, that's, that's a really important question. So the training set is about 150 sources from the 900 that we had in our Chandra sample. And those 150 were ones that had been identified in the literature already, mostly through the work that um, Stiel et al. did with their XMM survey of the disk of M31. So they had done an XMM survey earlier, um, had come up with optical counterparts for a number of objects. And I think most of those were confirmed through optical spectroscopy, although I'm not totally sure about that. 
So we use the same four classes as in our study. So um, X-ray binaries, AGN, supernova remnants, and foreground stars, but they were not evenly distributed between the classes. About half were X-ray binaries, and then AGN were the next largest, and um, there were not. There were only like a couple dozen, a dozen supernova remnants. So um, that class imbalance is is a problem, and it shows up in lots of machine learning. Um, situations. If I were doing this project again, I would probably do some more sophisticated calculations of accuracy, um, like the balanced accuracy and, and other methods that take into account this class imbalance. Uh, the other thing that, of course, we always worry about with astronomy and machine learning is that your training set is, in vague generalities, usually brighter than your test set because which things do you know better? The ones that have been studied before. And so you kind of cross your fingers and hope that there's not a huge uh, distinction between your training set and your test set um, for that reason. But there's a limited, you know, there's only so much we can do about that because we're not in a situation where we have the gold standard, the right answer in many cases. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's a super interesting uh, question for general thought and discussion, I think. Um, um, Paul Green had a question for you also, and uh, he wants to know if, I, I was just wondering if there is a relatively simple way that you might rather than using, you know, the stock Chandra uh, energy bands, just like use a histogram of um, the counts in energy. Is that, is that something that's algorithmically, um, you know, reasonable to consider? Uh, or where, the, where would the roadblocks be there? Well, I, I can see sort of two directions that that leads you, right? One is okay, we need to describe the histogram somehow. So we compute the mean and variance or we compute some summary statistics or something. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we feed that into our machine learn, learning algorithm. Or, you know, we fit a power law because that's what we do and we, um, we, fit, we put that in. Or if, if we're just doing counts in bins and histograms, then, the, the features that you would feed into your algorithm, again, would be the counts in each bin. Um, but I'm not sure how that's distinct from the um, defining specific Chandra bands in that case. Right, I guess it's just, I guess it's just narrower bins essentially. Yeah, I mean, there certainly are methods for classifying optical spectra where you have a very long 1D vector and that's the thing you're trying to classify as opposed to a dozen numbers or something like that. Right. And so you could try to use some of those techniques as well. I, Given the size of the data set we had here, I don't know that it would have helped, but, but you could certainly try it, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, we have a few um, more general questions to think about because um, there's, yeah, a lot been covered and, and it's very, very stimulating. So um, Raphael is asking, uh, it looks like we're converging in general towards one, having lots of sources probabilistically matched between X-ray, optical, IR, et cetera. And two, um, having effective methods for supervised classification. So that makes a good case for supervised classification of many sources. But what about the many sources that will never have an optical counterpart? Um, how well can we do with X-ray alone? Um, yeah, would somebody like to address that on the panel? I can start if you like. Great. 
I, Thanks. I think that uh, these are actually the most interesting sources because either they were uh, uh, varying or they are at high ratios, so you needed to have uh, deeper data at the longer wavelengths. So classification alone for this, uh, this kind of sources, I don't know how really it would be important because without redshift, it's not that you can do much more. So I would like first try all the possible way to find a correct multi weapons counterpart and then study further. Uh, classifying based on the X-ray alone, given the fact that, that the X-ray probably is going to vary, I, uh, it gets a, a limited interest without the other multi weapons properties from my point of view. So I think that the object for which we do not have a counterpart, we have to invest more uh, time, more efforts in trying to find it, rather than uh, uh, saying probably is a star or uh, an extra object from the X-ray point of view, and then do nothing because there is nothing that can be done. I would have a question for Mara on that. Um, since you have uh, derived your your spectral priors uh, for X-ray. Uh, is there something you could do with that? I mean, ignoring uh, the the, uh, the spatial uh, information, obviously, uh, but just on, on on the basis of the uh, 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 spectral priors. Again, if you are speaking only about uh, X-ray uh, spectra alone. Uh, the signal to noise or the photons are not enough for often for making a real classification. Actually, we do the opposite. Based on classification from, of star or extragalactic from the multi -weapons, then we suggest to the X-ray spectra what the object should be, just because there is not enough counts for doing the actual work. That's what I was telling before. Uh, either it is a very defined object where you can even have the lines as you can get even the redshift, but otherwise it's really limited the information that you can get often just from the X because of the, the signal to noise essentially. Interesting. Um, okay, we also have a, a, a general question from Jeremy Hare. Um, I've reversed his paragraphs because I have certain prerogatives. Um, as someone who's applied um, machine learning methods, he says, I know very well that it's easy to get classifications, but not always easy to trust them, especially at the faint flux end. As we move toward more complex tools like machine learning, outlier detection, et cetera, for discovering interesting unstudied types of sources, how will tax, how will time allotment committees need to adapt when deciding whether follow-up observations are warranted or not? Like, should they believe that this is uh, such an interesting source or not? Do we, do we have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I think this is a problem actually perhaps less for the x-ray data community than and huge problem for the optical community. Uh, when when Ruben starts out starts uh, pumping out a million interesting sources per night, um, that's a much bigger problem to deal with. But I think it's going to be there's going to be some trial and error, right? You folks have this, have developed this great algorithm and it seems to produce interesting things and you other people have developed this terrible algorithm that just finds cosmic rays. But the question of following up new and interesting transient sources, I mean, that's something that the X-ray community has been dealing with for a long time. So in some ways it's not maybe so different here. True. They'll just have to deal with it. Um, uh, I, so I, I had a, a question. Um, since we're really, since astronomy really is moving very strongly into the time domain, um, we've we've been talking 
mostly about doing classification based on essentially on SEDs and uh, looking uh, looking at uh, multi wavelength counterparts or spec you know uh, X ray spectral properties. So how how does anybody uh, think about or foresee in, beginning to incorporate the variability information um, across potentially multiple bands? In, in making uh, um, uh, classifications and even in identifying counterparts. Well, we can, sorry. Arnold. Uh, we, we, we can uh, assess uh, but there is variability and the level of variability. I think the first requirement would be uh, to actually uh, uh, find a good way of uh, uh, classifying uh, the, the variability. Um, and uh, Eric Fagelson said, said something about that uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, but uh, if, if, if you don't have, uh, classified the, the variability, uh, then there is uh, very little you can do. By classified, you mean parameterizing the variability, basically? Uh, classifying it in the sense of uh, bursts, uh, uh, repeaters, uh, sort of uh, continuous variability, uh, uh, periodic variability, of course, uh, uh, that, that kind of... Uh, um, yeah, uh, qualitative uh, uh, classification. Very true, and then that could be in any wave in any wave band. Yeah. Yes, but we need an basically a sensible and an accepted uh, classification scheme there, and criteria uh, to to assign these classifications. Right, which also depends on signal to noise, etc. Yeah, Mara. I totally agree. This is exactly what I will have answered. I'll just say that in addition, we have the problem of the cadence of the observations that also define your variability and the length of covered time that allows you to see whether an object is valuable or not. In principle, if you have two possible counterparts and one is very and the other not, probably the counterpart is the one that is very, but can be that the other is varying at longer, uh, maybe later, uh, or it was varying yesterday, and you do not know it. So that is really a, a problem. LSST, uh, Rubin is going to help us, but it's going to be for a certain amount of, uh, of years. That is going to help, but as Arnold said, we need to find a way to classify the variability and able to use it for every source. And a very important parameter will be uh, the uh, time scale uh, of the variability, uh, because that says something about size, obviously. Great. Uh, Rudy, it's 12.32. Should we wrap things up or could we discuss another question? Uh, if you have another question, we can. I totally was just zoning out by paying attention to you all. I didn't notice the time. Um, we, maybe we'll take one last question or parting thoughts. Okay, well, this is this is kind of gleaned from a few previous questions or thoughts. Um, um, using using machine learning in um, either either just using X-ray properties or using multi wavelength properties or even eventually uh, using variability. If we're trying to find the right counterpart for an X-ray source. Um, Effectively, the question becomes, are we biasing ourselves towards uh, more common types of X-ray sources, right? Because the, uh, the training set will, um, will give us sort of a probability distribution of what, uh, um, what to expect. Um, and so that's clearly a concern because it, as scientists, we're we're maybe more interested in finding weird things, 
uh, rather than picking the counterpart that seems more probable. So that's like seems like a fundamental problem. Um, it's also maybe compounded by uh, what was mentioned previously, the fact, uh, I think by Pauline, the fact that um, the training sets are often brighter than the test sets. So I just wanted to hear people free associate on that issue. Any comments? I, I have a comment and maybe also a slide to show because this was one of my backup uh, questions to myself at least. Um, if you have, uh, if you are taking into account all the properties uh, for uh, defining whether or not an object is mixer emitter, and you find that close to your object there is one, uh, that is a possible counterpart. There still be the possibility there is uh, another one, but at least uh, there is already one that behaves like a typical X-ray emitter, right? When I was saying at the beginning that the training sample have to be representative of the X-ray population that you are trying to find the counterparts for, I was referring also to your point. If you are using the wrong training sample, you are going to risk to get the wrong answer. So it's definitely our responsibility is those that are making the work to make sure that the training sample is, uh, is the correct one. It can still be that uh, you are still missing some sources because we were not looking all sky deep enough before, and we will find the new interesting objects. But at least now we have 20 years of XMM and Chandra deep observation that allow us to have a more or less a fair in information on the type of uh, X-ray emitters that we are able to find. So I'm optimist, uh, I say, I'm positive that we are getting most of the time the right one. Can be that there is an additional one, uh, but still uh, most of the time, I think we are getting the right one. Personal opinion. Yeah. I, I, would, I would add to that, or make a plug for, for just the, the, the pure spatial uh, uh, cross-matching um, uh, because, uh, it is um, agnostic uh, of, of, of any uh, preconceptions about uh, uh, what other properties uh, the, the sources may have. Um, uh, that's, that's obviously not the end uh, of, of, of it, uh, but uh, there is uh, uh, this value uh, in the, the, the pure uh, spatial uh, cross-match uh, uh, catalogs. That's that's easier easier to say if you're uh, talking about on-axis Chandra sources than off-axis XMM sources or Ebrozita sources, but yes, good point. Well, if you take <laughs> all parameters properly in, into consideration, uh, it yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Any other thoughts on this topic? Um, otherwise, I think we are good. Pauline, and, um, sorry, Pauline has a th uh, thought. <laughs> Pauline, go ahead. I, I was going to agree with what Mara said, which is that we should know what we're right. doing after all this time. Um, but the other way to, to pick out unusual objects is with unsupervised machine learning, where you're not trying to put things into classes that you already have. You're just saying, tell me the classes we see in the data. And uh, with the right algorithm, you can sometimes find the unusual objects there too. Right. Okay. Any other thoughts, questions? Well then generally, uh, thanks to everybody for really stimulating talks. It's really interesting and also uh, really useful, I think, especially going into into uh, the future. Uh, Rudy, any further comments or hints? Uh, I wanna thank you, Paul. I wanna thank you all. That was a really interesting talk. Um, I was um, just totally locked in and I was thinking about all the things that you are talking about. Um, it's very exciting stuff I think you all are doing. And uh, thank you again for sharing that. And if you wanna carry on any of the conversations, uh, please do so in the Slack channel. I'll see everybody else tomorrow, I okay. hope, for our last day of the uh, Chandra 
data science workshop uh, for science talks. And then remember the week after are the um, tutorials on various software. And so if you're interested in those, please respond to the survey in the form that I sent via email. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.